buried deep within the American National Archive is a top secret document once regarded as the most sensitive on Earth. In 1930, America wrote a plan for war with the Red Empire, her most dangerous enemy. The central part of the war plan is blue and red bombing each other's cities. But America's foe in this war was not the Soviet Union or Japan. It was not even Nazi Germany. Plan Red was code for an apocalyptic war with Britain and all her dominions. The plan emerged from the Great Depression amid the rise of evil regimes at a time when even some in America had been seduced by dark forces. We will reveal how such an astonishing document came to be written and who would have won if it had been put into practice. We will show how our greatest ally almost became our deadliest enemy. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room of 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Washington handed the American government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with America. War didn't break out between Britain and America in the 1930s. But there were times when we came closer than you might imagine, as American journalist Peter Carlson was to discover. He was on a visit to the American National Archive in Washington, D.C., when he found himself entering a strange and unsettling world. I was a reporter for the Washington Post, and I was here at the archives, and I was introduced to a gentleman named Mr. Taylor, who had been working at the archives for 60 years. So you're introduced to somebody, you make small talk. I said, well, what's the weirdest document you've seen in your 60 years here? And he didn't think for a minute. He immediately said, War Plan Red. Lying untouched for years, Plan Red contains detailed preparations for a massive war between America and the British Empire. Joint Army and Navy Basic War Plan Red. This is our baby. It shows where they would fight, what troops would be needed, and how the battles would unfold. Okay, the Red situation. Throughout the plan, the Americans refer to themselves as blue, while the British are red. On page five, we've got national characteristics. The red race is essentially homogenous, more or less phlegmatic, but I love that word, but determined and persistent when committed to a policy and is noted for its ability to fight to a finish. I think that's a compliment, I'm not sure. Phlegmatic, Britain may have been, but they must have been doing something right. The British Empire at the beginning of the 20th century was the greatest the world had ever seen. But this did cause some resentment. We now think of Britain and America as having a special relationship. After all, they did fight side by side in two world wars. But at the start of the 20th century, the two countries had been at each other's throats for well over a hundred years and much of the fighting had taken place in the British Dominion of Canada. It's important to remember that the United States was born out of a revolutionary struggle against Britain. Our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is about how Americans successfully defended Baltimore against a British assault. The first great conflict was the American War of Independence, which began in 1776. But the hostilities didn't end there. In fact, you could say that was only the beginning. Then after that, there was the fabled um, American invasion of Canada in 1812. There was another uh, fracas in 1839 called the Arrowroot Wars. There was uh, a real war scare 
in the uh, fall of 1862, uh, Britain mobilized its full contingency force of over 20,000 regulars and uh, brought them to Canada within a couple weeks. Then we had the Fenian invasion in 1866. This was about 800 Irish Americans who tried to invade Canada, thinking this might frighten the British into liberating Ireland. Several hundred of them, I think as many as 600, launched a mini invasion from uh, uh, the New York area into Canada. And you could say that was probably the last time that things got incredibly sticky. But we're now talking, you know, over 125 years of pretty tricky Anglo-American relations. Even during World War I, the two were not the cosy allies of popular memory. America resisted entry into the war until 1917, and even then, fought as an associated power, rather than as a full ally of the British. After the armistice, mistrust turned to bitterness. After the war, there's a question, of course, then, of who owes what money. And the Allies renege on repaying Britain their share of the debt, which leaves Great Britain really holding the bag in terms of the nine billion pounds that it owes the United States. The U.S. was not being helpful. The U.S. was still demanding that Britain repay all of the loans that the U.S. had made to Britain. And the British would say, no, let, let us get the money that's owed to us that we loaned out to France and all these other states. The demand that the United States made that war debts be repaid created a terrible image of the United States in Britain. Meanwhile, in the United States, the British desire to have war debts cancelled created an image of Britain being ungrateful and not understanding what their obligations were to pay their debts. So the relationship between the two countries in the 1920s was far from good. In part two, we will see how, as the 1930s started, the Great Depression and the rise of political extremism made people on both sides of the Atlantic think war between the two countries may not be far away. The existence of an American plan, written in 1930, for war against the British Empire, now seems shocking. But America and Britain had been at each other's throats for much of the 19th century, and because of the land border with America, the British Dominion of Canada was where the two countries tended to come to blows. On the Canadian side of the border, you can still find places like Fort Henry, built by the British to deter American aggression. What is incredible is that preparations for war against the British Empire were still taking place just across the border well into the 20th century. This is Fort Drum, one of the largest army bases in the USA. If you want to start a war with the British Empire, this is the place to do it from. We sit right on the edge of Canada. Our ranges go up to within a couple miles of Canada. Um, if you were to hit the interstate, which is just a couple miles outside of Fort Drum, you can get to Canada within 30, 35 minutes. It, it is the perfect place for training for this type of war. Shockingly, back in 1935, it looked as if this was exactly what the American military were preparing for. As the ink was still drying on War Plan Red, the American army conducted the largest maneuvers in their history right here at one of the key strategic jumping off points described in the plan. The 1935 peacetime maneuvers was the largest attempt by the U.S. Army ever to bring that many forces together into one place. When you bring that many people onto the battlefield, what is it going to take to feed them, equip them, house them? How are you going to be able to move an entire division from the bivouac onto the battlefield? And these are all the things that they tested here. Heavily camouflaged, extensive munition dumps were maintained by the Ordnance Department. Why was America so threatened by Britain they would go into detailed preparations for an attack on her empire? To understand this, 
You need to look at relations between the two countries around the time America started work on Plan Red. Ironically, it was an arms control conference that sparked major problems. As the 1920s proceed, things uh, are reasonable, but then they go into a pretty steep decline after the Geneva talks in 1927, again dealing with naval power. There's a, a big dispute between the British and the American over cruisers. Then there's a little thing called the British Navy. From 1588, when it licked the Spanish Armada, the greatest battle fleet in the world. An arms control negotiating process highlights the tensions and, and conflict. So what is a process that's meant to move away from thinking about war and away from armaments and away from possible confrontation, actually in the context of the negotiation, might highlight the differences and the uh, antagonisms and frustrations. The talks go very badly and um, at that point, it's, it's at, at that point and the immediate aftermath of the 1927 talks that there is conversation in Britain among leading uh, ministers about the idea that war is not inconceivable with the United States. Even Churchill says, people say that it's inconceivable, but of course we all know that it's not. So for Churchill, it's not that war is likely, but it's that war is certainly a possibility if we get ourselves into a position where the Americans can feel that they can push us around whenever they want to. It was against this backdrop that the military started work on the plan. They were well aware of what an incendiary document Plan Red could be, one of their army chiefs described it as amongst the most closely guarded documents on earth. It was therefore all the more amazing that they made a series of incredible blunders that let the world know what they were up to. The construction of many new airfields was necessary in order to accommodate the large numbers of planes required for the extensive operations. The war plan leaked out many times. In February 1935 there were hearings to build these secret air bases. The section of the hearing that was in secret, this was supposed to have been redacted as a secret testimony. But the government printers published the whole transcript. It's on the front page of the New York Times, May 1, May 2, 1935, uh, that U.S. has budgeted money to build three air bases on the Canadian border, one to be camouflaged for the purposes of surprise attacks on Canada. Portable landing mats make a firm landing area through which, in time, grass will grow, camouflaging the field from aerial vision. When President Roosevelt saw the newspaper stories, he was furious, but mainly because news of the secret hearings had leaked out. He told the British and Canadians there was nothing to worry about, but it was hard to hide the fact that many in America would have liked nothing better than a showdown with Britain and her empire. Press opinion on the whole was pretty nationalist, and each side was raking the other over the coals. And of course, newspapers are very important, both for stoking public opinion, but also sort of representing public opinion. The East Coast generally is, I mean, in this period, they've become slightly Anglophobic, but on the whole, the East Coast are, are, are kind of pro-British. Middle America is very anti-British. Uh, the West Coast is anti-British. The South is ambivalent. But certainly in mid-America, in Chicago, and uh, all of these places, and the Chicago Tribune is um, owned by a man named McCormick, Irish-American, hates the English. America felt that, you know, Britain would throw the U.S. under the bus in order to stay number one. And that would take the form of uh, preventing the U.S. from engaging fully in foreign trade or, or having access fully to all the world's resources. And, and so there was a sense that somehow the British were a cynical and devious and manipulative power. Faced with such a dastardly foe, the Americans were happy to contemplate any measure to keep the British at bay. This is very interesting. A little addendum added, a piece of paper pasted on the top, written all in caps, number 11, to make all necessary preparations for the use of chemical warfare from the outbreak of war. Chemical clouds of gas or smoke are heavier than air. They roll along the ground, filling woods, valleys, trenches, and dugouts. 
There are all these memos back and forth about what they're doing. And there's a memo signed by General Douglas MacArthur about under what conditions we would use chemical warfare against the British. And basically the conditions were, uh, if we don't have a treaty with them, um, precluding it. Well, okay, we're not going to gas these five million guys unless it's perfectly legal. And then came the Great Depression. To make matters even worse, the world economy was teetering on the edge of an abyss. Looking at these war plans, it's a very dark spirit of the age in the early 1930s. We were wrestling with the worst depression in our history. Some of us were out of jobs. Some of us stood in bread lines. Some of us suffered homemade aggression. Some of us were choked with dust. Some of us had no place to go. I think that had some uh, capacity to color uh, these plans. At the very least, war seemed more possible after 1930 than it had in the 20s. War Plan Red is um, a, 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 a dismal war. Much of the war planning is built on strategic bombing of cities. In the war plan itself, it says industrial centers. Well, what's an industrial center? It's Albany, it's Toronto, right? So a central part of the war plan is blue and red, meaning, you know, Britain and Canada and the United States bombing each other's cities. So by 1935, there had been massive military maneuvers. Money was being sought for secret air bases and authorization was granted for the use of poisonous gas. But as Peter Carlson discovered, behind the scenes, the Americans were also conducting cloak and dagger operations. March 26, 1935, subject military reconnaissance, Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh, there's a famous name, flew to and was present at Port Churchill on the west shore of Hudson Bay from August 1st to the 3rd, 1931. No written report of his conclusions as to the practicability of that area for seaplane work is available. Looks like they're willing to send Lindbergh over to spy, but they don't really want to start a war. Well, Lindbergh uh, is the first guy to fly the Atlantic in 1927. Four years later, in 1931, He's on this shadowy mission, presumably from the American army, to scout out the possibilities of using seaplanes along the Canadian border. What gives this special resonance is that Lindbergh, the all-American hero, was also a keen supporter of the burgeoning Nazi movement in America. He kind of got a little palsy-walsy with the Germans, the Nazis, to put it bluntly and uh, was a leader in the America First movement, which was sort of quasi-pro-German or neutralist. I pledge. This I shocking pledge. footage shows Nazi rallies taking place in the heart of America during the 1930s. Of America, as a republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for was it the case that Lindbergh and the other American Nazi sympathizers thought Hitler would support them in a war against the British? It turns out Hitler thought war between Britain and America was inevitable. But if American Nazis thought Hitler would aid them against Britain, they were barking at the wrong tree. Hitler wanted war between Britain and America, but amazingly, he wanted the British to win. He thought that would be the best outcome for Germany. Hitler 
looked back at the history of the British Empire, very ruthlessly striking down its rivals one after another to you know, secure its global dominance. And Hitler looked at the British, and his assumption was that the British still had this in them, that, that this was something that they were still capable of. So, you know, for him, it was, it was just a perfectly natural thing to assume that the British would view the Americans through this the same sort of lens, uh, this sort of Darwinistic lens that, that Hitler himself used, and that he could work with the British potentially against the United States. Hitler was convinced the British would act as they always did when faced by a newly emerging power, war. By this logic, to Hitler, a conflict between Britain and America seemed inevitable. Britain, during the 18th century, emerged as the world's superpower as a consequence of a series of wars fought against rivals, against Spain, against the Netherlands, against France. In the 20th century, Britain faced the rise of Imperial Germany and the United States, two rising powers. This situation looks very similar to what had happened in the past, and all the ingredients were there for another major war. Indeed, one of the great stories to tell in the 20th century is why didn't war break out between Britain and the United States when there are so many other examples of these wars occurring between rising and declining powers. With the world in turmoil and centuries of conflict between Britain and America, Plan Red was starting to look like a realistic military option. In the next part, We'll see how the plan would have played out, and who would have won if it had ever been put into action. Plan Red was developed by the American military in the early 1930s for war against the British Empire. At the start of the plan, the Americans laid out their goals. They planned to eliminate all British Empire land forces in North America, as well as naval forces in the North Atlantic. They would then extend their control across the world's oceans to destroy British trade and bring her to the point of economic exhaustion. The question is, would they have succeeded? To find out, We've gathered military experts from the three main countries affected by the plan. In Canada, we are at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. This is the main officer training facility for Canada's armed forces. In the UK, we are at the Joint Services Defence Academy in Shrivenham, which is where senior officers learn how to fight major wars. And in the US, we are at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Much of the original work on Plan Red was done here. Well, here's Pringle Hall, where the wargaming took place. And they would fight the battles here on the floor. And then there were balconies around the gaming floor so that observers could watch what was going on. Well, John, they still have a, an adequate map to give us a strategic picture of Plan Red. The plan doesn't really tell you how the war starts. It does say, though, that the British will be sneaky and will try and, before the outbreak of hostilities, sneak reinforcements to the uh, possessions uh, of theirs in the Caribbean, like Jamaica and uh, Bermuda. The war begins, however, and the first thing the U.S. does is, from Boston, takes three army divisions, 25,000 men, that doesn't seem very much, but there you have it, screened by the fleet on M plus three, assault on Nova Scotia. This assault on Halifax, Nova Scotia, was key to how the whole war would develop. Yet the Americans hoped to launch the attack just three days into the war. If the Americans take Halifax, they've cut the Atlantic off from the British. They have created a situation where the heart of Canada, between Montreal and Quebec, is also cut off. This was a bold move, but hard to pull off in such a short time. During World War II, the Allies discovered that successful amphibious landings took months to organize. This attack on Halifax was unrealistic and would have failed. 
Britain would still be able to bring reinforcements to Canada and would retain a naval base on the American side of the Atlantic. From Halifax, the British can blockade uh, and force the U.S. fleet, if it doesn't give battle, to, to move farther south. The Americans reckon that if their assault on Halifax failed, Britain would have a naval task force and eight army divisions in Halifax within 30 days. Faced with this prospect, the Americans needed to mobilize, and fast. The second major element of the plan is to form a giant field army here to drive north into the heart of Canada. This army would be used to launch four attacks. One of these would come from the Fort Drum area up towards Ottawa and Toronto. A second would strike the Great Lake border crossings near Buffalo and Detroit. A third would head north into the center of Canada around Winnipeg, an attack that would cut Canada in half. And a final assault on the western seaports around Vancouver would stop the British bringing in forces via Australia and India. It's a pretty neat plan. and It doesn't waste any effort trying to invade here. It does talk about seizing bridgeheads here at Sault Ste. Marie, at Detroit, and also here at Niagara Falls, so that the Canadians can't attack these major U.S. industrial centers, and at the same time keep the flow uh, of goods going in the Great Lakes. So there'll be a, a battle for naval supremacy in the Great Lakes again. Plan Red is unclear about how quickly America would launch these assaults, but it does lay out their worst fears about how many troops Britain could bring to the war if they gave her enough time to get organized. A year into it, the Brits have 2.8 million guys and the Canadians have 649,000. So there's three and a half million British Empire guys fighting us somewhere around Winnipeg, presumably, or Halifax. Three million people. We would presumably have an equal number and it would be like the Battle of Verdun. That would have been fun. The assumption was that every British troop, every British reservist, uh, and every soldier anywhere throughout the empire, in Australia, New Zealand, India, that these forces could be very quickly mobilized and transported to Canada and would be able to undertake a massive and prolonged land war against American forces. If that happened, the war could easily become a bloody stalemate. So the Americans thought speed was of the essence. Ideally, they needed to mount their attack on Canada within the first six months of the war, before Britain could organize significant reinforcements. On paper, it looked as if the Americans had every chance of success. But the outcome would depend on how Canada responded. The Americans wouldn't have had it all their own way. Canada had a plan of her own called Defence Scheme Number 1. The key to it was to move quickly. I mean, the key really was to strike at the Americans before the mobilization process could get very far progressed. The idea was go south, hold ground, and then stage a fighting withdrawal where you just destroyed everything that would slow the American advance north. Well, the overall strategy of Defence Plan Number 1 had like three or four essential elements. The first was to move south from Vancouver towards Seattle and, and Portland, Oregon, and then, if they could, Spokane further in this region and control the sort of try to control this region there. That's right. And then from the prairies, the idea was to uh, strike south uh, across the border towards Fargo, North Dakota, and then if all went well, uh, would have tried to move on to Minneapolis. There would be an offensive along the east coast of Lake Ontario. Canadian forces would move from somewhere in this region, maybe at the uh, forces base at Kingston, south to uh, the Mohawk River down to Albany, New York, and I suppose, if possible, New York City. This wasn't an invasion. These were raids. The plan was to push as far into the USA as possible, then fall back, blowing up bridges and railways as they went. It was all designed to slow the Americans down, and the plan was the brainchild of one extraordinary Canadian officer, Brigadier James Sutherland Buster Brown. My father was director of operations and intelligence of the Canadian Army. As soon as he developed the scheme, he needed more information. And uh, so he carried out reconnaissance, and this was characterized as being spies. 
Here it is, three men in their 40s. Workingman's cap looks like Andy Cap sitting on a fence. What they are is the three Canadian officers from the general staff driving around New York State, taking photographs of vital points. And when you take a look at the photographs here, the covered bridge three miles east of Williston looking up the Winzuski River from the left bank, well, it's the Burlington, Vermont area on that old invasion route to Montreal. Where there are rivers, there are bridges. Where there are bridges, if you blow the bridge, yeah. the Americans are going to have, it's going to take time for them to uh, come back. It's still a primitive transportation culture by comparison with today. So the, the chances of actually slowing down a possible American counterattack were actually quite reasonably good. So the stage was set for the first six months of the war. America would mobilize a huge army to launch four offensives into Canada before the British could arrive in force. While the Canadians staged lightning raids into the States to slow down American preparations and buy the British more time. Which strategy would have been successful? Could the British arrive in time to save Canada? Unfortunately, the Canadians were in for a nasty surprise. The British never for a second seriously thought about the possibility of mobilizing troops and sending them to Canada in order to try to withstand a American invasion. The assumption was that Canada itself would eventually be overrun and conquered, that Canadian trade would be lost. You know, that, that was inevitable. Yeah, I mean, I think logistically what you're looking at is a misconception entirely about what kind of war would have taken place in North America. I mean, the idea that Britain would raise an army that large and then project it across the Atlantic into Canada just doesn't fit with British thinking at all. So whereas the Americans are thinking in terms of we conquer Canada and the war will pretty much quickly come to an end, the British are thinking that's just where things are going to get started. Since the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, Britain had been the greatest naval power on Earth. Her instinct was to fight wars at sea rather than on land and that would dictate how she would respond to the American attacks. What you would want to do would be able to hold on to Halifax, eastern seaboard, and then also maybe perhaps be able to hold on to one in the south from Bermuda to be able to interdict any of the trade and commerce that comes off the eastern coast of the United States. And if push came to shove, the Royal Navy would start to attack Boston, New York, Charleston, and eradicate American shipping on the high seas. Now that's a war that nobody would want. Even if the bulk of Canada was overrun, the British could still conduct a naval campaign from their ports in Halifax and the Caribbean. So who would prevail in the battle on the high sea? The American planners knew the naval battles would be critical, so they put a lot of energy into working through such an engagement. The records of their war games give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of how they saw such a naval battle unfolding. So, John, shall we look at the Great Battle of the Atlantic as preserved in our illustrious archives? The British fleet is being assembled right. in European waters at the beginning of the campaign to, yeah. to move across the Atlantic, and this is considered move one. Right. There's something of the game of blind man's bluff here as both fleets are trying to locate each other. This must be the British battle fleet. And here, here are the battle is, cruisers. Right. Moving into action. Okay, here's the blue main body, red main body. They're closing rapidly. Yeah, indeed. Around move 24. And as you can see, there's a lot of action going on. It's happening. It's there's gonna a happen collision. It's going to happen. <laughs> now they pulled up here in an attempt to uh... to make the engagement be that the two fleets are mm -hmm. going to parallel and yeah. fight each other with their main batteries firing at each other. Exciting. Oh, here, and here it ladies is. and gentlemen, is the outcome. Here we see some submarines sunk, destroyers sunk, but look at the damage here. Yeah. Torpedo hits, 500-pound bomb direct hits, 
Well, this is very much like Jutland, though, because there's simply damages. There are no battleships sunk. This isn't decisive. These losses are heavy, but they're not decisive. The conclusion of the war game was that the two navies were evenly matched. It would have been virtually impossible for either to achieve outright victory, which suited the British just fine. British hope was that this would be enough, that you can't protect Canada, but if you can make things difficult for the Americans and cause them enough sort of economic dislocation and just inconvenience, that eventually the Americans are just going to get tired of it and say, okay, we've, we've hit a stalemate, there's a deadlock here, we don't have anything left to gain, uh, we've got Canada, uh, you know, now's the time to bargain and to, to negotiate some sort of a settlement. In the end, the war would have cost thousands of lives, caused devastation in Canada and all along the American border, but at sea, the British Navy could have held the Americans at bay. Canada would have been lost, but the British Empire and her trade elsewhere would be intact. But if there really was so much ill feeling between the two countries in the 1930s, how did we end up as such close allies just a few years later? In the next part, we will find out. When American journalist Peter Carlson discovered a copy of War Plan Red buried in the American National Archive, he had a blueprint for war between Britain and America. We have now war-gamed these plans to see what the outcome would have been. If war had broken out, Canada would have been quickly overrun by the Americans, but the British Navy could have contained the threat at sea, eventually leading to a negotiated settlement. However, despite the enthusiasm within the American military for Plan Red, as the 1930s progressed, the plans were becoming ever more detached from political reality. That war didn't occur between Britain and the United States uh, is due in part to the statecraft of the leaders of the time. The First World War was a horror that no one wanted to go through again. Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. There was nothing beautiful to them about war, and they had no desire for another. Leaders of the interwar period had a crystal ball in front of them that the leaders before 1914 didn't have. They could see the consequences, the horror of what war would entail. The high cost, the loss of life, the disruption of the international economy, they could see that they didn't want to have another war like that again. And so leaders on both sides of the Atlantic were committed to never again. Britain in particular was sick of war. While the American military prepared for the worst case scenario in Plan Red, they failed to understand that Britain would do pretty much anything to avoid conflict with the United States even at the expense of her national interests. 1937-38, it was a new trade agreement between Britain and the United States. Now, the, the negotiations were pretty fraught, and the, the, essentially the British didn't think that um, economically they were getting a good deal. Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister, basically said, well, we're not doing this for the trade benefits. We're doing this to try to entangle ourselves with the United States more, to try to improve the general relationship, and it's worth paying. The irony is this reluctance to jeopardize transatlantic relations was very similar to the reluctance Britain felt towards confronting the other rising power of the age, Nazi Germany. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. This is now regarded as a shameful policy of appeasement, a policy that has been roundly criticized ever since. Yet despite Britain's reluctance, the world was changing and events were moving beyond her control. Today we rule Germany, tomorrow the world. What kind of talk was that? Far-sighted politicians on both sides of the Atlantic began to recognize what was going on and act accordingly. 
Roosevelt would not subscribe to War Plan Red. He was not one who could see a war between Britain and the United States as occurring. Quite the reverse. He wanted a strong Britain. He wanted a Britain led by leaders who, were will, who would be willing to stand up to the Nazi challenge because he understood that a strong Britain was also a good defense for the United States. That Britain and the United States had a common enemy in Nazi Germany. And Roosevelt and Churchill both understood this long before their publics understood that danger. In the days to come, the British and American people will for their own safety and for the good of all work together in majesty, in justice, and in peace. And with that, the special relationship was born. <laughs> With hindsight, it seems incredible the two could ever have planned for war against one another. So what significance did Plan Red actually have? I think the lesson for today from War Plan Red is the way that in the context of your era, you become a kind of paranoiac, imagining enemies and preparing for wars that are based on your imagination. You can imagine how these things come about. War planners have to plan for war. They have to plan for the worst possible scenarios. So you follow the logic of it, and the logic of it says, well, we've got to invade Canada. We've got to terrorize civilians by bombing them. We've got to use poisonous gas, and so on and so forth. And um, none of this is supposed to get into the public domain because it's just the logic of war planning. So. I think the lesson of War Plan Red is that military planning can become insane on one hand and it be becomes a bad habit on the other. And neither are realistic for our real threats to the nation's security. Plan Red was, in my opinion, a realistic set of contingency plans drawn up by the Americans for a war that they had to take seriously. But they didn't do it in a way that was unrealistic. I think that's a good recognition or a good realization on their part that the threat is very serious, but the likelihood of that threat actually developing is relatively remote. It is easy to dismiss the plans as fanciful, but from the perspective of the 1930s, they were a very sensible precaution. Plan Red marks the point where one great empire faded as the next grew daily in power and stature. Almost uniquely, the transition took place without a major war breaking out between the two nations. But it was perfectly reasonable for America to imagine it could have gone either way. In the end, there was no need for an American war with Britain, because they won anyway. The 20th century became the American century, as the United States took its place as the most powerful nation on Earth. Let us hope it is as painless the next time the baton is passed. And Plan Red itself? It was to meet an ignominious end. It's 1939, June 15th, the Joint Board to the Secretary of War. Subject, Joint Army and Navy, Basic War Plan Red. One, a restudy of the current Joint Army and Navy Basic War Plan Red shows that plan to be wholly inapplicable to present conditions. Whew, I guess we're canceling this war. Uh, we can put away the poison gas. Two. The Joint Board recommends that while no further war, war planning be done under this plan, it be retained in its present condition until such time as another joint war plan requiring a major effort in the Atlantic becomes available. It's obsolete, but don't throw it away yet. We'll just keep it on file.